And over to you, Daniel. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of you to make the time to show up um, because it's a it's a busy world um, and it, it, that, that holds for all of us. So um, if you see my hands waving and suddenly notice why does it have really black hands? Um, I, I pre literally ran in from um, shoveling biochar onto a compost heap. Um, so and just noticed I haven't actually washed my hands. Um, <laughs> but it's just lovely that we have this possibility of being like I was half an hour ago, really deeply immersed in a place on the land in conversation with our larger being. I love Melissa's poem. The, for me, there was so much in there that is for me the essence of um, what I learned at Schumacher um, 20 years ago and what really changed my trajectory in life. Um, last Thursday, I had this beautiful conversation with Satish Kumar, um, which I will put online soon and, and, and share with you. And it just made me realize again, how, what a privilege it was to, to A, be able to talk to somebody like Satish. Um, we were talking about how he walked with Martin Luther King and uh, with Did Nhat Han in, in the States when, when they walked from New York to, to Washington. And all his, like the, the time with Vinoba Pabe and, and um, understanding what Vinoba Pabe actually did, the largest transfer of land ownership from the wealthy to the poor without violence. That, that's, um, that's massive. And, and creating a land trust that still exists and, and support. So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but what, what I mean with all that is for, for me, it's just lovely to be in this community of uh, like-minded people who, who've been inoculated with this, this Schumacher spirit that um, really affects people deeply. And, and, and I'm a example of that. So um, rather than me rambling on, I'm, I'm just curious how your journey has been and if anybody wants to A, reflect on, on their own journey in, in the course um, so far and how that might relate to a question at the end of that, um, the floor is open, we're, we're sitting in a circle. Would anyone like to speak? Yes, Shan. Um, hi, Daniel. I'm trying to change my view so I can see you. There we go. Um, I think for me, uh, I've done a lot of individual community projects and um, I'm tr really trying to look at something at a macro scale now and look at systems and figure out where are these places to intervene. And our, um, our module now is design in place. So we've been talking a lot about our personal um, interactions with place and what we think place is and what is belonging. And I'm really just stuck on this idea of power in place and thinking about how how we live and what we do is really is so much is determined by the power structures in our particular place and so it could be government corruption or global finance or there could be war all of these things and so i'm trying to think as a designer how can i design with power in mind and also to interrupt it or to shift it in some way, but I'm not really finding a lot of resources about that. So maybe, I don't know if you could speak to, do you know designers who are working in, in this like political ecology landscape or something like that? Because I, I really just, I need something that's more macro than individual projects at this point for me what how i want to focus on things mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, yeah. unfortunately i actually can't remember the, the, the somewhere in sweden in the university of alto um 
there are some people, if I remember correctly, um, working on the politics of design and design of politics, uh, of and the power and um, design and design of power structures. And um, I'm not even sure, I mean, this might be wrong, but Alistair Fudd, look, who wrote this ecological design book ages ago, might actually be in in uh, working in that, but um, yeah, uh, this is a, this is a vague memory. But but I think your question opens up: is this is it is a deeper question than on a personal level? I'm I'm reflecting on a lot at the moment. Um, bringing a bit from Melissa's poem in, what well, that poem spoke to me about was how minute our human timescales are in relationship to the timescales of life as a planetary process and how tiny in that larger flow of transformation that we're all expressions of, what we call history is, and particularly what we call kind of the, the lead up to the current situation, um, 250, 500, make it 8,000 years, even that's a blink. And right now, I think we're pushing closer to a period of transformation that our system scientists warned us off in the late 1960s and early 70s. And if we're now really with open eyes looking at that likely transformation that's nobody knows, nobody has the crystal ball is coming at us. Um, designing large scale system structure, pre -sub or designing systems change, doing the met meta view and trying to build the, the on interfere with power is opening up the question, which, which power is more powerful and will be more long lasting um, lives regenerative capacity to even bounce back from the kind of destruction we've had on the planet or these power structures that currently from our very short human time scale are so frustrating. I mean, that they, as you were saying that I immediately connected to my bioregion and how true it is what you were, were saying, how political interests, financial interests, wealth, um, lots of different aspects come together to to make not everybody equal, but some people very um, effective in, in either slowing down or misguiding the long trajectory. And people who really deeply care are kind of like ankle biters somewhere, <laughs> yapping, saying, don't you see, we need to do something else. It's about life. It's about all of us. Uh, um, but I'm like also in this conversation with Satish, I briefly mentioned. Satish brought me personally back into the, the exact opposite that the power of the intervention that we all have in our daily lives and how we live our lives. And even this kind of ambivalent view of saying there's lots that needs to collapse, but how do I live in a world without going into the kind of Fear, which is where I was actually starting my conversation with Satish, that I've I've been a little bit overwhelmed with um, the sense of such profound imminent transformations that all the structures we currently hold for granted may start disappearing like dominoes, dun, dun, dun. and um, how close, like even people who are so wisely interconnected and built a global local tribe, like the Schumacher family. Um, what are our local connections in the places we truly live in and feel connection to place in? And what's the power of not trying to systems design what's happening with that place, but trying to embody that place? In a, in a way that you actually do transform it through your own practice. Like the, the Tish put it in his beautiful simplicity, um, doing small things with great love. 
um, is sometimes more powerful than an intervention point than trying to... He reminded me, Daniel, you can't change the world. Daniel, you can't even have the audacity to think that you can change the future of a bioregion that you live in. You can try to dance with that system and influence it in somehow, but, but it, it was a very humble recognition, even reflecting on his own long life of 87 years, how he himself is just one small river merging, a tributary of a larger river. And that tributary disappears in the larger river, but the larger river changes. And I know this is a very philosophical answer to a very practical question. How can I get into um, more design and power um, research for, for my um, for, for your work? But yeah, that, that I don't know if that serves. Um, happy, happy to hear what, what your reflections are. Yeah, I think I just, um, like, I don't have any illusions that I'm going to change the world, but mm -hmm. I just think that like there are real material realities that people face. And so um, people need food and places to live. And when the power structures make it so that this is hard for people to even subsist, then it's really hard for me to just think about, um, well, if I embody a place, it'll get better eventually, you know? So it's just like feeling helpless in a way, even though I know that I can do small actions and I do think that they matter. Um, so I'm not saying that small doesn't matter at all, but I think I'm just trying to change my approach and I'm looking for examples of other people that might be doing something different that I haven't tried. Well, yeah. I, my, my own trajectory i've tried to like you, you you can try to make systems change in a sort of building big alliances and um getting everybody together to align their narrative and and even reposition all those small stories that 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 are currently and I, I honor that like being an activist with working with community projects it can be frustrating to see how you might be making real change to some people's life or a particular place, but overall in the wider system, um, things are going in the other direction. And, and to truly work regeneratively is to somehow work not just on your project, but in the way you work on your project, transform the next nested hole, the, the proximate hole, the wider system you're embedded in, um, in the very process of doing your work by changing people or not not changing people but making people realize their own potential and their collective potential and the, the potential of the place itself and the, the big indigenous re, re remembering indigenous wisdom of being regenerative is to even take it to the place where we are expressions of place. That's what I mean with the embodying. I don't mean a sort of very woolly, warm, warm kind of, let's do a workshop of embodying the place, which is also lovely. Like, But um, what, what I mean is precisely this, not necessarily like pulsing in and out. If you need to interfere with policy and power structures, sometimes just naming them and making more people aware of them in a place already has transformative power. Um, making all that more visible and and it's not it's never in. I just sit on my little in my little cave and transform myself, and then the world transforms. It always has to be through my own transformation. I transform the world around me or it's it's a mutual dialogue so so the, the the connection to my mind is in how you do the small things within the context of your region that enables everybody to learn from each other or simply become more aware of that we're not alone in this and to connect like whatever issues you were working on in, with your community work to not just look at them as individual, if I'm sure you don't, but a lot of people are in their community projects and don't see that what they're doing is actually an expression of a regenerative culture in the wider region they live in. So how, how do we 
rather than talk about we need to do a grand systems design for regenerative culture of the future, come back to the future potential of the present moment in which we recognize that there are hundreds and thousands of organizations and individuals in places and bioregions that are somehow already trying to let life's healing and regenerative impulse come through on the focus of their issue. Um, single moms, people without enough food, people out without access to housing. Um, but I think what's what, like in terms of effectiveness of, of the power change is we need to find a powerful place sourced narrative that brings all of those different projects into an awareness where they don't necessarily need to change what they're doing, but realize that it's not the only important issue, but everybody else is also. And, and in that larger story, both in terms of the more strategic access to funding for these organizations, if you can coordinate, like that's what we're trying to do here on Mallorca at the moment, just coordinating five or six organizations that work on ecosystems restoration or regenerative agriculture on the land side, and five or six who work about the Balearic Sea and, and um, marine protection. And by coordinating them just enough that they still continue their work, but have a shared narrative, they then can um, tell a story that is suddenly not their individual project, but a tr regional transformation. And, and I think that's where I, my sense is doing your research on how to do the system change is a wonderful journey, but the, the marrying is when the community work that you've done before and that understanding come together into a new way of practice. But that's almost verging on projection and apologies if that's not where you're going. <laughs> no, it, it is. I think connecting all the little things is, is one of the keys to collective action and collective power. So thank you. I didn't want to um, hog all the time, so. <laughs> Put so, my hand down. Thanks for that. Hey, Daniel, thank you. Um, I wanted to start from um, when you asked us to share our experience as Shumis yeah. and, and end up with a question. Um, so um, I had like 20 years of experience in practical ecology. So I, when I came to Schumacher, I was sure like I came with a place of ego in a way. And I encountered a lot of resistance inside of myself uh, to open up from um, um, to find in myself this uh, reductionist solution oriented um, approach and to open up to um, a less cynical way of seeing of uh, judging the narrative of separation in myself and dealing with all this thing, which mean, meant a lot of inner work, which was hard for me in the first uh, month I was here. Uh, so in a way, in a um, quote, it's like from ego to echo, let's say, this uh, process of inner work. And I wanted to ask, uh, in your book in the end, I think you talk about a few uh, things you do for inner work, like time in nature, mindfulness, and counsel, I think, something like uh, this. I wonder if since the time passed, uh, since you wrote the book, if you had uh, more reflections on these issues, if you have other tools, and if you do things together with a group and not uh, just time spent in nature solo and like if you do um, also collective practices of this or also individual ones like what um, works for you because that's in a way I think the community here allowed me to be open and, and to have a space to do these reflections uh, and of course the nature here which gives you a lot of time for uh, time in nature uh, so yeah so if you have any um any uh, reflections or iterations of uh, those things? Thank hmm. you. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because it, it, it kind of makes me want to share a little bit how fascinating my journey has been since the book came out and how it coincided with becoming a father and then the pandemic and then looking for a house and moving and refurbishing a house and planting a food forest and still getting used to the dynamics of um, how a 21 year relationship transformed when you suddenly become parents of a little being together. 
And um, and in many ways, like these deeper practices that you're asking after that that helped me um, so often on on my journey. Um, for a while, I forgot about them, and I really got quite disbalanced and quite. I actually just this Christmas, I sort of realized maybe I should stop saying I'm skirting burnout and understand that for the last 15 months, um, my pattern has already been a, a burnout pattern. And, and by actually admitting that to myself, allowing myself to be even tougher on making choices, choices about what I can and can't dedicate time to and, and what my true priorities are. And, and, and so I'm, I'm a little bit anti-cyclical from the large systems transformation thing into a very personal, like even surprise of saying after all this practice and spending my time at Finhorn and yoga and Taekwondo and Tai Chi and um, the work that reconnects and counsel and process oriented psychology and blah, 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 blah. Have I not got a bit further than this like I I really felt so raw and so unfinished in the last few months and then at the same time there is this capacity to go onto a meta view and say wow that's beautiful what a gift um that at 51 you can go into mush again in order to find what the next part of the journey is. And, and in that, to come back to what you already named, like I also, because as I was going to mush about all this, my kind of role of people liking to get some sort of positive message about the future out of the work that I've been doing and personally being in a bit darker of a space for a while, but also realizing in myself how disabilitating that darkness and that fear can be, how necessary it is to look clearly into where we're at, but needing to transform it. And, and one thing that I definitely came to in, in that moment, maybe about eight months ago, where I said, okay, if everything around us is going to, like all the solutions, all the structures are going to transform, collapse, dissolve, and be rebuilt in some other way. How can we design with building blocks that might not be there? Or how, what, what do we know in terms of real solutions that, that we could now put into place in order to make that transformation less traumatic for more people on the planet for ideally as many people as possible, um, all of them. And what I realized in my own way and also where I feel drawn personally, professionally now is to come back to these, what seemed for me too, at a point too little. Why do I sit in a circle with 12 people or 20 people um, doing a nature of council workshop for three days um, blending this circle time with solo time in nature and and the work that you've all familiar with through Schumacher education and, and work that reconnects and all that. And I'm sort of coming almost circle again in seeing how deeply important these practices actually are and how for especially council is so powerful because at the heart of it is is the triethica, the, the three questions I, I like to quote when people ask me about questions, which is the, the deep wisdom of our collective heritage, which is that every decision you do, ask, does it serve myself? Does it serve my community? Does it serve life? And knowing that the three of them are just different expressions of the same totality, that are, they're, they're not separate, but also understanding that the very living in relationship to a larger transforming whole as an emergent property or expression of that whole requires us to navigate those three questions with everything we do. And, and for me, counsel 
does that as a practice. Um, so I'm personally now preparing to, as the spring comes in, to invite more people onto the land that I've been the custodian of for the last two years to, to sit in council again, because I believe that the capacity of sitting in a circle and really hearing each other, both with the fears, the traumas, and where the hearts, the, the essence, the core of the person is speaking, it is what we will, what, what is the most, like if, if I don't know what to suggest to anybody because I have really no idea what the future is holding, then working on people's capacity to be with each other in that circle way and listen to what their heart says and what the collective heart says and what the context, the place itself says. For me, that, that is actually the most powerful practice. If I get young adults and community leaders around Mallorca to take the call and sit in a circle like that, it might be more transformative than if I bang on government office doors and, and say, don't you see, we need a structured bioregional regeneration plan and um, all of that. And ideally we need both, but I'm not the guy who's knocking on government doors at the moment. I don't know if that's like, that's a very personal answer, but you also started with your personal journey, which I really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Melissa, thank you for the poem. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> If we found together yesterday in our council <laughs> dinner, <laughs> and it was an idea to read today. I found very inspiring what you said because uh, about my personal journey. I think, uh, as Shimulk said, we came here with a lot of ideas and concepts about how our genre will be. And then um, for me, what is emerging right now is the, is the importance of listen different kind of intelligence that we are not get used to. So we are all, always trying to learn the things in the mind. And I think uh, to look for the future that emerges, we need to, to raise different kind of intelligence. So for me, this is so um, tangible right now. And because first of all, I was thinking about, oh, some institutions, they need to collapse. And then we need to know how to hospicing these institutions. And then the thing about the small, do the small things were very, uh, in my mind and also make the invisible visible. And I am so interested to talk about barriers and boundaries right now because of this, because I think it's a way to block the communication. But, and then yesterday I had a, a nice conversation with a friend and we were talking about the need of healing the earth as well, because I was very interesting about collective trauma and uh, because I think lots of things that is happening uh, in my country as well. It's so related to the collective trauma and if, and if you are in this trauma, we can see the eco side that is happening in the world or in our place. But and then, and, and think about healing people, but no one is thinking about healing the earth and to acknowledge what is happening in the earth and what you are, you are having, doing with the earth, with the nature, with the ancestors. And then I think maybe in this bioregion that we need to know the history, the second step is to acknowledge that we did so much, not in, in a negative way for the earth. And we cut the trees, we are deforestation uh, every place. We are building destruction with these building ships, weapons, and we are mining the lands. And even when you think about nature, we are thinking about nature in a way that you are, you are, we 
are always trying to get something, get some inspiration, but we never think about maybe you should try to give something back. Maybe you should to acknowledge what our ancestors did and do something about that. And then we feel have this collective intelligence in deep list and maybe you could start with this and then um, do the delicate activism as Alan Kaplan suggests as well and look for the things and slow down is, is the second step. I don't know, just this step I want to share right now that. <laughs> yeah, the, for me, the, the framing of that, like I, I agree on many levels and the framing of, yes, the danger of getting too much into the analyzing one, one's own trauma and, 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 and personal healing of traumatic um, experiences can collapse the attention to a very self-ego, my skin encapsulated boundary story and how it's been challenged. And at the same time, I think the, the very giving back is we give ourselves back to more than human nature because the narrative of the separation that it is somehow different to heal humans than to heal nature. It, like I, I remember while I was at Schumacher in 2002, early 2002, um, we already went through the, had already gone through the teaching period and there was a conference in I think March of 2002 in um, Findhorn which was called Restoring the Earth. And we declared with 220 people um, the 21st century as the century of restoring the earth. And the conference was organized, co-organized by Alan Watson Featherstone, who, who founded Trees for Life in Scotland and has, has brought back large areas of Caledonian forests in his, in his lifetime, in the last 30 um, years. And he was connected to pioneers that now are in much more people's mouths and their projects 20 years ago and managed to really bring this unique group of international practitioners together around how can we become healing presences in the ecosystems that we're expressions of again. And in asking that question, we are asking a question that reconnects us to not what, like, I, you're right. Yes, we have done huge destructions and, and are still doing it. But we, in the longer time span that I was referring to earlier, are also the same species that evolved in intricate reciprocity with the bioregions that we felt ourselves expressions of, not owners of. And we wouldn't be here right now if we hadn't had regenerative ancestors who were indigenous to life, all of us. And I think in this, like to come back to this conference, that the T-shirt of the conference had a beautiful Celtic human nature drawing, one of those knots drawings. And, and then around it, it just said, nature healing humanity humanity healing nature nature healing humanity humanity and it's 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 a circle um because the two are not separate and the the what has most done damage to what we call nature as other than human is the fact that we're talking about nature as other than human and that we as you were alluding to that we see only the utilitarian value and that even you were calling that beautifully that that even when you make the shift of all oh, it's about more than just taking resources from the world um it's about reconnection to nature and again it becomes a utilitarian value of oh i'm going to do a workshop of reconnecting with nature so i feel better about myself and that's the that's a good thing to call uh -huh. But beyond that is the understanding of how do I actually understand that all of this, even the destructive technologies that we've brought about, are expressions of this larger transforming whole that I'm part of. And 
the whole in itself, life's regenerative process is so much more powerful than any of our clever designs and analyses and, and intervention points and so much more long range than anything we do is only contributing to a larger process. And, and so for, for me, it's what, what you were bringing out is, is like there, there are, my, my PhD research, which I did after leaving Schumacher, um, was on design for human and planetary health, precisely because of this nature healing humanity, humanity healing nature. And back then, nobody really was interested in this concept of planetary health. And now, and this is only 16 years later, um, post my, my PhD, um, there's a planetary health alliance. Most of them don't know about my work, but 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 the um, very fact that that conversation has been led by health policy makers to understand that we cannot foot the bills of future health systems if we don't heal the ecosystems we're part of and the planet we're part of. And even the understanding that when we talk about planetary health and the link to, to human population health everywhere on the planet, um, the only way to intervene is at the regional scale. You cannot intervene in that pro um, process from the top down with another COP meeting on biodiversity, or another COP meeting on climate change. Um, and that's really powerful allegiance, alliance building and language building and wordsmithing for all of us. As we work, we can you can point at the Planetary Health Alliance and say, look, they, they're, they're looking at the figures and the collapse of health systems because they understand medically, scientifically, how critical ecosystems health and human health are interlinked. And I mean, the pandemic was a example of that as well. Anyway, there are lots of hands going up and I'm babbling, so I'll uh, give some other people a chance to. Thank you. Yeah. Elise, hi. Hello, Daniels. Thank you for the chance. Yeah, I now um, we are doing a project regarding place based one, and then there is a question in my mind like, uh, in the past, like we are more like a globalization, a big corporation. Then in the Schumacher way, we focus on like small scale, like a regional scale that you mentioned a while ago also. So and in and I was reading about the scale base in your book. Then you mentioned like uh, you point out that why we are focusing on like the regional and traditional um skill we should not fall into the trap of radical regionalism and narrow-minded parochialism so uh oh it is like a, a another contradiction about smalls so what do you mean by that and could you elaborate more with some examples thank well, you good question um well it 2015, I worked with Ecover on a project here in Mallorca, and, and somehow we ended up calling it global. And somehow that term has become used in, in many different places as this need to not just think locally, but to understand how local action sits in global transformation and, and to understand that many global problems are only solvable on the local level. But the danger of parochialism and narrow-mindedness is a that it's healing now and it's actually coming in a beautiful way together. There was a time when there was a group of people that were localizers at the community scale. It was also all about the neighborhood, the li little eco village, um, and they weren't really understanding or, or, or acknowledging how nested their little experiment was into the supply lines of global supply lines and regional dependencies. And um, it was almost like there was an argument between bioregionalists and localists of our bioregions are too big. And, and now I think that has evolved to a conversation that is about local futures where we understand place in that fractal way, in that way that it um, is both ultra local inner community face to face action in a Schumacherian way, but it's also 
nesting that awareness into the wider bioregion and as a collaboration between bioregions into the effect on, on planetary health or healing the planet. The danger of this, what, what the parochialism is, is um, pointing towards is that something we already hap uh, see happening, like in the last five years, the far right has captured a lot of the mimetic concepts of what was more, maybe even slightly more left um, or, or liberal Schumacher type thinking. Um, and what's now being blended in social media and wordsmithing is that even in, in Germany, people from the IFD could be found speaking about bioregions or re-regionalization, but then they mix it with their insidious um, fascist Nazi uh, thinking of re-migration, which is a new way of saying kicking people out that don't come from that place. Yeah? Um, and, and so what, what I mean is, as we pay more attention to the local, it is vitally important to not overswing the pendulum of saying globalization was a failure, and now we're all localizing, and stop the conversation about how do we globally collaborate to make that localization or regionalization possible. And, and even down to, yes, we want maybe a future as soon as possible where we stop taking minerals from the earth crust to build technologies. And we want to innovate biomaterials, local flows, alternatives to some of the interesting technologies we've invented in the last 200 years to also do positive things like us talking together. And so we cannot be um, narrow-minded, that was the other word I said, in, in saying it's all about localism. Like how many people have I met that tell me it's all about local production for local consumption 100% on a Zoom call? I mean, that's ridiculous. You will not build an Apple MacBook Pro in your bioregion out of scrap from your compost heap. And so therefore, if we see value in these connecting technologies that allow us to, to learn together. What we really need is a very nuanced conversation about what technologies we use where, and if we come towards a future where we have limited energies and limited material availability, how do we use that wisely? So it serves humanity and it serves life. That's a really critical nuanced conversation that we're not having yet. And, and that's what I mean with let's watch out as there will be. It's already starting. Like, I mean, even in corridors like the strange Davos forum, the WEF that, that just happened, people are talking about localization with a different tone. It's not poo-pooed anymore. It's not that's ridiculous. We're in a globalizing world and these people are talking about local futures. Uh, no, suddenly um, they're, they're going oh, wow, yeah, the supply chains are crumbling. And um, whether it's the pandemic or war, like you can't rely on um, what you order anymore because prices are shooting up in different parts of production and um, people down the supply ecosystem say, sorry, we can't deliver your kitchen because we couldn't get any glass from there and any screws from there. And and so, so suddenly even these extractive economic players are, are starting to realize that decentralized manufacturing is hedging their future. Yeah? So and, and in all of this is so many mimetic levels talking to each other, everybody with a slightly different intention. And how do we navigate that um, wisely in a salutogenic way that we keep people talking to each other, that we don't become narrow-minded and say, I don't talk to a large global mining company about regeneration. You talk to them, you make them reflect because we might actually need some of that for the next 30 years in order to build a bioregional future. Um, that, that's what I was sort of pointing towards with that sentence. I hope that helped. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you for the elaborations. Um, David. 
Oh, hi, Daniel. Hey, I'm, no, uh, I mean, hold, hold on a sec. I, I, I've, I've got the suggested, you've got, Chantali, how, how are we going to do? Should, should we do one more question and then go to the break? Yeah. Let's do David and Alice's question and then head for a break. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Um, I'm on the economics program. Um, I appreciate you finding the time to talk to us all and for the EDT people to arrange it, you wonderful peeps. Um, my question is really calling upon your um, your sort of two decades now of post Schumacher um, wisdom and knowledge and skills and experience. And the question is really in two parts. One is with all that wisdom and experience and amazing lessons learned, I'm sure. Um, what what advice could you give, or what lessons would you share? that could be worthwhile to this collective, which is will graduate later this year. Um, and are, are, are there two or three lessons that you could share? And secondly, now, you know, Schumacher has now been going for three decades with the short courses in the nineties and then the master's programs in the last two decades. Um, do you feel that there's more of an opportunity for the Schumacher alumni collective to work together on more projects or more activities? Both interesting questions. Um, I mean, first, you might have to remind me of the second one when I get to finish with the first answer, but um, the, just a little anecdote. I remember when when I, I couldn't leave Schumacher after doing the masters. Like I, I, I was living just across from the old post and in one of the, these gray blocks. And in centuries and um and i just decided to stay my, my my now wife then partner was living in totnes and and we could just afford to basically stay on and i was a helper at schumacher and facilitated a few courses for about half a year after the the masters was over and in that process i was sort of reflecting on what you all have coming up at you of like and what next and how do you make anything out of a master's in holistic science when nobody really understands what that means or you when they ask you say well yeah let's go for a three-hour walk rather than you have five minutes and i'll explain it to you and um and i was a bit frustrated and brian goodwin who um was really together with stefan holding the the masters at the time um was with the new students and I felt also this energetic shift but my mentor was now giving his attention to the new cohort and, and I was the helper and I, I in a frustrated way asked him like hey what am I going to do with this and 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 he was pretty harsh in the sense of saying we never say you're going to get a job with this master um, and we'll make you think in a different way and and I'm glad that he said that because it made me realize then that I would have to reinvent in my own path with it. And in my very personal story, I had written a master's thesis that was so big that Stefan didn't want to read it and suggested I should take two thirds of it to save as a PhD. Um, like to, and, and so I kind of had this possibility of continuing what I was working on in my master's in, in the background. But I also wanted to be practical. So I went to Spain and, and ended up being the course director of a center that claimed to be a blend between Schumacher and Findhorn outside of Madrid. I quickly found out that it wasn't. And, and then Joanna Macy was doing a course there, which was what initially had lured me into believing that they were the real McCoy. And, and I, I remember talking to Joanna and she asking her, should I go back into academia and do a PhD? And she said, I don't think you'd end up being an academic, but I think doing a PhD would put a string on your heart that would be really useful for you. And that was also really wonderful advice and, and, and very fitting. I, I, I left academia after a short postdoc. But what I'm trying to communicate with that is it's not going to be easy to just walk into a job it'll be much easier now than it was back then like with regenerative economics i think there's a lot of people interested in that um right now but i would advise 
Well, for me, it was powerful to remember the network every now and then. Remember that all these people that other people only talked about, I sat in a small room with and did the dishes with and queued up for lunch with and had a human relationship with. And over the years, particularly the first 10, 15 years of, of building my own learning, I called on these connections. So it, I think it's remembered that with Schumacher and the effort you put in, you, you're creating not just the, what you've learned, but you're creating y- yourselves as a core, which leads to your second question, as, and and, um, and you're creating a network with the people who teach at Schumacher, um, and that's that's very useful if you if you use it in, in the right way. And with regard to the the big dream, how do we bring all the Shumis together around the world and coordinate them and make them do things together? Um, there have been many, many iterations over the years. Uh, Schumacher Worldwide and, and Julie Richardson going out and, and um, another guy called Constantine, something or other, um, trying to ho- hold this. Um, if, you, if you're interested, you can unearth a lot of attempts to, to make that network happen. Um, maybe it will start to happen naturally. To some extent, it is already happening. Like a lot of the people that I ended up working with through Guy Education in Brazil were also somehow Schumacher linked. And so, um, and and yes, now we have platforms and stuff, but it's the, the, the danger of these networks is that they take time. And um, when people are still trying to build a career, they don't, they have a bit more time, but they, they also have necessities. And when people have already engaged, with requests from the world to be of service, then they have to navigate how much time do I bring into this network? So again, like if there was an enlightened philanthropist, um, I think the power of leveraging that network into a wider conversation would be huge, but you'd almost have to resource the people to have that conversation is my take. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate that. Alice. Um, hi, Daniel. Um, um, it was it's more like a reaction from what you said about um, healing trauma and healing the land. You said to focus more on what we've done well than only what we've done bad. And for me, it sounds very much like appreciative, appreciative inquiry. Um, and that's something as a French... I've discovered here because we are more rest to focus on the problem than to focus on what's going well. Um, and f- that's why I would like to ask you, how do you think appreciative inquiry can be a power to change and how can we use it? Hmm. Super interesting because it, you just made me realize something that of, of course I've come across appreciative inquiry in a community context, like for example, when I lived at Finthorn, the Finthorn community was going through a long appreciative inquiry process in order to find its next iteration. Since then, it's had another five. Um, um, So it's a powerful way for the system to begin to see itself, know itself, understand itself, um, feel that larger uh, collective that your story sits in and and influences ideally in in a, in a kind of green meme sociocratic type of way um but what your question also made me realize is that the fundamental shift that is so beautifully articulated by Carol Sanford and, and Regenesis group that is one of the aspects of working regeneratively which is going away from problem solving mentality and moving towards understanding essence and potential and and really working with not the outcome of the design. So we're we're needing to change a new whatever system and then at some point we deliver it and then we sign off and it's done. But to use those, whatever it is, solution processes that end up proposing a thing or a, a structure or a process as an opportunity to build capacity in the individual and the collective to keep learning and appreciative inquiry is a wonderful tool to accompany that kind of place sourced potential of people in place based approach as opposed to the problem solving approach um that's yeah but, but it's it's more a reflection i'm 
I have to also admit that I'm not a super expert at appreciative inquiry, but but, but I think your question is onto something there. Um, because what we do need, like I called it in my book, I called it living the questions together too many times. Um, but it is for me one way of summarizing why I put 250 questions in my book and what I believe is actually part of the remembering of how to be regenerative in place as place, which is to hold anybody's suggestion of solutions as intelligent and sensible as they might seem, lightly enough to, even if we collectively choose to implement them, keep questioning them whether they're still appropriate five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line, to, to begin to see that everything we build, the human structures, is ephemeral in some way or another and will transform, crumble at one point or another. And so we need to pay less attention to the problems and the solutions and more attention to manifesting the potential that is inherent in all of us to keep journeying, to keep adapting, to keep listening to what is now needed, to, to keep fitting in to the proximate whole place, bioregion, planet. Um, and yeah, I think last thing, What's of course powerful is that there's a globally trained group of appreciative inquiry capable, like people who can hold this and bringing that world together with the conversation about how do we create regenerative cultures in place, looking at the potential of ourselves and this place, not about of, of problems. Woo, you've just given me goosebumps because that's, that's a huge intervention point multiplier. Um, really interesting. We need to discover how to do it. No? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it was more about what you said, like how do we not do stop looking at problem solving, but more how to and potential to bring more potential to what's working. Just in a nutshell, I keep this is a, this is one thing that I learned from Brian Goodwin, who I mentioned a number of times. Who, um, founded the Masters in Holistic Science at Stefan. Um, he was one of the, the world-leading experts as a biologist and mathematicians on the emerging field of complexity theory and, and particularly the, the whole concept of emergence and so on. And um, in a nutshell, what I've learned from him is that complex dynamic systems are fundamentally unpredictable, uncontrollable, that everything that is more than three interacting variables is a complex dynamic system. So everything we deal with, including ourselves, and that the only way that you can interfere with a system appropriately, because you don't, you can't control it, you can't predict it, you can't really manipulate it, but what you can do is connect the system to itself pay attention to the quality of relationships of its nested expressions and to the, inf the quality of information that bef flows between the different areas. And if, he, if you can use that suggestion, whether you think about the body and how to heal the body, how to heal a family, how to heal a community, it's all about the system becoming more conscious of itself, beginning to see itself in its dynamic process. And through that, the system itself starts feedbacking and responding. And, and so you, you become regenerative and learning through that. Okay, oh. little add-on. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But I think maybe the people want to take the break, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Thank to you, Alice. Thank you, Daniel. Let's take a break for eight minutes. Let's be back by quarter past 11. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And to the next section of the Q&A by just going back to the question you invited us to, to answer at the beginning of the conversation, which was about reflecting on our experience. 
And I think one of the things that really has been striking me a lot along the way on my journey is the interest that people have when I talk about my story. Um, for example, I went back to the business I was working in before I, I came to Schumacher last week, and I hadn't been back there for about six months since I left. And the kinds of dialogue and the interaction I had with my old colleagues was so different to what I would have had beforehand. And I found that people were genuinely really, really, um, I guess, open and curious about the experience that I was having at Schumacher. Um, and it also reminded me of um, just reflecting on that and realizing the growth that I um, really have experienced since, since starting at Schumacher. I found that I, was, I felt like quite a different person going back to someone that I was so familiar with and with the people that I was close to. And I came back as a, a kind of different person, with a different energy and a different perspective on things. Um, and yes, I remember when we spoke last time, you said, um, one of the most important things that we can do is tell our story about Schumacher and our experience here. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just um, elaborating on that a bit and explaining why you believe telling Schumacher's story is, is one of the most important things that we can do. Because I, I think all of you are daring. You're daring to leave behind a more conventional academic pathway. You, you're daring to invest quite a lot of money and time into what still, not as much maybe as 20 years ago, but still is considered somewhat a fringe institution. But what's shifting is that the level of interest internationally in that fringe institution and the conversations that are having there is just so much higher now. And for every one of us, that made the step of actually going to Schumacher and finding it in its current state of incarnation because the Schumacher you're experiencing is not the Schumacher that I, I experienced. And then strangely enough, st there's still a very deep connection and, and, and sort of um, heads, hand and heart thread that runs through it. Um, and by telling your stories, also the like as honest and open as uh, as they can be like all, like your your expectations of the place and how they weren't met and how you at the same time got so much more that you didn't expect and um all all of that i think is a powerful invitation for people to dare to make make steps like that and it's not necessarily that they then all have to go to Schumacher uh, I don't even know whether they could cope with it um, mm -hmm. to scale. like they, 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 they keep talking about it but it's I mean even now like it it keeps changing from more online to back to more face to face which is wonderful like when I when I was there we were nine students with three permanent tutors so we, all our sessions pretty much had nine students and three tutors in it, despite the fact that only one of the tutors uh, was was um, holding the session. So like Brian and Stefan would just sit in and, and still be part of the this little learning community. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the power of giving people an example of saying, I was either still on my learning journey and I thought I was going to do this, but then I found about, out about this place and it changed what I thought I was wanting to do with my profession in one way or another. Or more and more people have a professional background, have already experience out there in the world and are stepping out of that rhythm to reflect and say, how can I be more of service to the world? And how can I do that in a, in a more holistic way, whether you're doing the, the EDT or the, 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 the um, regenerative economics masters is, it's just one entry point in, into that. And, and I, I think that it is also like there is, there's some really powerful meme seeding that is going on there, that, that, that like allowing what Stefan holds with an animate earth perspective to actually infuse you as a modern, postmodern being and bringing that back into the mainstream through, because it's, it's more powerful if it's your story and you're talking about your story 
if you're talking like a lecturer about what I learned at Schumacher and don't you see, you have to, eh, people will find it much more easy to dismiss it. But when you talk to the people, you re-meet, like you were just beautifully describing, that, that, that know you before you went there. And they will, like, you, your own transformation will speak for itself beyond what you, you're saying uh, and, and whether you're happier or more content or feel more connected. And, and, I, and it's that what people resonate with more than, I think I spent a lot of time um, in the first 10 years after Schumacher trying to put it into PowerPoints and, and give lectures at universities about it. And it doesn't really work like spread like that. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, I totally agree around this point around being, just being. And actually in some scenarios, that's enough to signal that, that change or actually spark inspiration from others as well. So thank you. Um, Chaitali, I think you're next. Thanks, Sarah. So Daniel, I was also reflecting on the question that you posed in the morning that how this experience of being in Schumacher has been for me. Um, I feel that uh, anyone who comes to Schumacher, they feel deeply transformed. And that is also what I'm working on as a project for this module. I'm calling it as Magic of Schumacher, which trans deeply transforms everyone. And this Magic of Schumacher is different for different people. For me, I feel that the magic of Schumacher was being able to have deep experiences. And what I also feel is that unless we have had deep experiences, our actions really won't make sense. And I feel that when I go back to India after I finish my course, um, I want to recreate these deep experiences for people back in India. So I wonder what 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 are your thoughts on recreating the magic of Schumacher somewhere else outside of Schumacher? And also what was the magic of Schumacher for you? Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that, like this, this attempt that we briefly mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, how, how to leverage the network and could not all the graduates become somehow um, multipliers of this impulse that that um Schumacher College is kind of seeding with people. Um, I often question to what extent does it need to be married to the brand? And particularly when you take it into the world, maybe it shouldn't and it actually serves more powerfully if it isn't. Like you can you can work as a as a shumi with with the things you've learned there, but um, with the sort of institutional side of things, like I've I've seen this with the Schumacher College in Brazil, who I don't only ob observe sort of on the edges, but it I know that as many people got hurt by the process of setting up that organization, how they were included or excluded who were ex shumis as there were people finding each other to work together. And, and so um, I think it's, it's more powerful to bring that work into the world with your, with your own community in your own way with a, with a new name. Um, for me, yes. What, what was the Schumacher magic for me? Um, I actually, actually, to tell you the truth, I always felt that what most strongly formed me 20 years ago, I think 20 years ago, Schumacher was much more intellectual than it is now. It was doing practical things, but but it was still trying to establish why it was able to run master's courses. So, I mean, we were heavily over-assessed in our year of uh, to write five essays and do five talks in the in the first um, four months. Um, and they were big chunky because they had to be sent to Plymouth for the external examination and all of that. And, and so at that time, it was serving me really well to have this sort of slightly more grounded academic research focus, how you, all the papers and, and all that. But it the, while it was talking about spirituality and bringing it in in different ways, it was also a bit guarded of not doing that too much in order to, to not jeopardize its relationship with the university world. And so for me, I needed to bring in my time at Findhorn and the Findhorn Foundation 
and and doing an experience week there and that to bring that more community and and deeply lived practiced nature connection um into my personal mix and then the third um aspect was the center for alternative technology the time i spent there doing really practical things like learning how to timber frame um building a micro hydro system um working on the reed beds and doing research on on how they were working um and it was really in bringing all of those together that i felt i got a rounded education and that said, I also recognized that in the last 20 years, while I was on that journey, Schumacher, to some extent, also started to incorporate some of these other aspects. I mean, the, when, when we were there, it was still kind of, there was the Dartington Trust and Schumacher was this sort of little experiment on, on the fringes. And Stefan was the estate ecologist, but frustrated with what the gardeners were doing without really listening to him. And, and the whole thing of like growing food was was more sort of a little garden, not with a horticultural course that, that was actually producing at, at a larger scale and, and so on. So, um, yeah, so in that sense, it's difficult to say what what is the magic that the, that I took from Schumacher for, I, because it is quite intellectual, but allowing to bring hand, heads, hand and heart together, even if initially as as a as a theory and um daring to see what multiple ways of seeing not just different perspectives but to actually learn the kind of Goethean methodology work that, that we learned from from Henry Bortov that really blew my mind or, or, or Margaret Calhoun and, and all these people um, have merged into wholeness since, but but I think that their energetic imprint is actually what makes the Schumacher magic to some extent, um, that, it, that it still has carried. I mean, Stefan holds a lot of that wisdom now. Um, like 20 years ago, he was yeah, as old as I am now, a, a bit younger. And um, so so now he's, he's an elder. Um, and yeah, I'm fumbling a bit. And the, the magic is the fact that, that I still feel connected with all of you who I've only met on a Zoom call or, um, because we're somehow connected to this, this impulse in the world, which I, I, I think has, oops, I don't know if you can hear my stomach was just grumbling, um, it, um, has somehow stood the test of time. It, it, brings a community together in in a sort of shared resonance. Like you, you, it's a bit like the same with guy education and the eco-village movement, being part of these communities. When you meet somebody, you don't have to start at zero. You can start huge ways of that journey of zero because you you know that that person had the shared experience that you that, that, that that you kind of know elements of, and therefore you can start the conversation at a completely different level. And that's magical. That in and of itself is, is powerful. Thank you, Daniel. I, I will, I've been listening to a few alumni from different years, and I feel that although the, uh, the experience and the magic is different for different people, but what I also understand that there is the common thread that you said that is in all of us that goes on and on and on. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Raquel. Hi, I'm Hi. sorry, keeping my my video off. I'm super sick. <laughs> um, uh, I think you talk it a little bit now with in Chaitali question, but I will keep my question. We talk a lot about the magic of Schumacher and we all know the deep transformation we are going through, but I would like to ask you, what was your biggest frustration in this journey and what you learned with that? At the, at the time? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I mean, while I was there, I was very frustrated because I was learning so much at, at I had learned before that so much at Findhorn and at CAP. And I, I was frustrated that the then manager of the college was wisely probably saying like to marry one fringe institution with another fringe institution doesn't like make doesn't necessarily make either of them stronger in a not friendly environment. I think now the environment and the context have changed so much that exactly that is not longer true. You need to bring these different organizations together and tell a co collective narrative. But I wanted to see collaborations between Schumacher, Findhorn and CAT evolving. And I even when I ended up being the director of Findhorn College a few years later, started the conversation that Brian Goodwin was in, involved in, Peter Harper was involved in, of, of creating a master's they would have been certified by St. Andrews University and would have brought students for residentials to Schumacher, to Kat, and to Findhorn. And um, unfortunately, so my frustration is that the, the, there's been so much effort put into these larger collaborations, and very often they they run into nothing. And um, there's something weird about how many times over the last 20 years people have said how can we scale out the impact of Schumacher whether it's through budding Schumacher worldwide or how can this be less for the privileged and more for more people and it it bumped into very small human stories along the way uh, um, the relationship with, between Dartington and um, and Schumacher, um, not finding the money, um, the 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 way that like for for a long long time I was frustrated that they didn't call on me or the network of graduates more to evolve themselves, and that um, so so I I've always had also a critical eye on, on Schumacher and how it was standing in the way of its own evolution. But then all of that said, somehow this, what well, we were just speaking to the, the magic, the way it touches people and transforms people is still there. And then it's the same, like maybe it's easier to speak of it and, and by analogy. When, when I was living at Findhorn, I was super frustrated because there everybody was so strong in that Sufi conversation of the longest journey is the journey from the head to the heart. And so they were all traumatized by their previous life's head world and found in Findhorn the heart commun community conversation of reconnecting to each other and more than human nature. But they, in finding it, because it was so healing of the trauma that they came with, they thought that that was the pendulum swing, getting out of the head into the heart. And I kind of kept shaking them and saying, don't you get it? It's about synthesis. We need to bring the head and the heart together. And you can only do that through action. And, and um, then three, four years later, I, whatever, matured, shifted my, uh, my energy around that frustration. And suddenly realized that all these places, whether it's Schumacher or Findhorn, they offer unique opportunities for people in a unique part of their journey. Some people come to Schumacher when they're 60. Some people come to Schumacher when they've just done an undergraduate course. And many people come to Schumacher when they're kind of in the middle of a midlife crisis or midlife transformation. And... I think that's what the, the value is of these organizations, that they give people a space to walk with a group of peers, not feeling completely dysfunctional anymore or whatever, but see, hey, ooh, there's other people in, in this whitewash. Yeah? Um, an opportunity to walk together for a while, be inspired by that, what, whatever Schumacher is holding, and make it their own. Um, so, yeah, that's it's 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 to understand that none, no place can do the whole journey, but they can offer people the opportunity to do their own journey in a way that serves them, and through that serves the world. I think that's where they connect those places: is that they're watering holes that are ultimately concerned about 
creating the, the growing learning context for people to be of service to themselves, to people and planet. Thank you very much. Sid. <clears throat> Hi there, Daniel. We haven't met before. Um, I'm a volunteer, what used to be called a helper. Um, we don't help anymore. Um, so I did have a question that I wanted to ask at the beginning. And I feel as though if I properly heard and understood everything everyone said up to this point, I would definitely have the answer to my question already. Um, to give you the context of the question, um, I used to, I lived for many years in a Buddhist community in France that has kind of exploded due to first a scandal and then um, COVID and now an economic crisis. So essentially their streams of income have been kind of blown away. And it's clear to me and certain others that um, part of that was part of the problem was that it became very kind of insular self-referencing uh, had a very hierarchical controlling power structure and and even though it was very alternative in some ways was very conventional patriarchal hierarchical and and so on and so I'm part of a small group probably there are other groups who are also trying to sort of shift that. Um, so my question was, how do you, how do you do that? I mean, essentially it's about, I mean, it's, it's an organ, it's a center that's part of a bigger organization and it has lots of heritage and lots of, so from what I hear already, essentially you can't just change it. Right. I mean, it's not like it works like that. You don't just go, OK, we want to change it. And this this is how we're going to do it. But I don't know if from what I've said, anything comes up for you in terms of approaches or um, clarifying questions or something that might. I, I guess for me, the problem is that I just get overwhelmed by how many different potential things potential interventions, potential ways of working there are. The group that I've been working with are great. And I think part of what we've found is that actually what we're changing is ourselves by having the conversation. And um, and it's been delightful to have that kind of process. But, but we're absolutely marginal, although we're slightly being listened to because some of us have been around a long time. Um, I don't feel that we have any power any authority any you know we're slightly regarded as outsiders um so yeah i'm just kind of i, I guess what I'm, I'm i'm by the way just to to try and make your head feel a little bigger we we've been using your book as the kind of main reference point for what we're trying to do um because i found it here and it resonated with people and you know, it's a great book. It's a wonderful book. It has so much in it. Um, it's actually, there's so much in it that I, I'm struggling to read it because I just get, I'm like, I could just kind of try and grok that bit for a few months. Um, anyway, so there you are. I don't really have a question. I don't know if I have a question. I guess, thanks for sharing all that. And in, in many ways, well, I, mean, I don't know how long you've been um, a volunteer at Schumacher, but but all that dynamic is present at Schumacher as well that, that, that you were describing. There is this long history of starting and trust living off the endowment and slowly melting it down to the core state and then panicking over how, how are we going to keep going, but to some extent, who's panicking is the public school educated leadership of the um, starting trust that, that is also panicking about their own jobs and not necessarily the wider mission. And so it's just, you get the whole same kind of 
patriarchal hierarchical structure in money interests trustees of one thing versus um the the visionaries of 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 what has never been much, more than a project within that trust which is Schumacher College um and and it can be really frustrating but then a bit of what we were just saying in the last two or three conversation or answers um questions to see that even in all that dysfunctionality there's still something that is giving people like your subgroup an opportunity to grow as individuals and and actually it also does transform and it does change and it does pick up impulses and um in in a way i think that's probably a matter for, a metaphor for how you can interfere in any system like it it it's really with the ultimate humility of you can envision the healthy systemic transformation and shift but you can't make the system shift you you can you can live in accordance with what you see the potential of the organism transforming can be and i think in terms of advice as much as that's always a dangerous thing to run into is is with with an organization like that it sounds like you do have a core practice where at least a buddhist alignment that you could come to find common ground in and then i mean that there's such potential of taking that and bringing it into the real world practice of daily living in right relationship with the community of life that it suddenly becomes not just a buddhist sangha but it becomes a, a bit of what tibnat hans students are now starting to do and have have done is is like going out and bringing that kind of way of being to the potential of transforming people and places in response to planetary crisis that that they they were in so it becomes really um much more topical to the, the, this day and age or the conversations around whatever funding and envisioning you can you can bring in marrying what a buddhist sangha can bring to the planetary crisis by focusing on potential rather than on problem solving because in, in many ways the buddhist B- buddha's insight of life is suffering is the frustration that it's if we try to change system we will suffer because <laughs> we're reflections of them and participants in them and they um as much as you heart it and will it um they respond in their own time in their own pattern and but but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it it's just and as this is me now speaking to myself like i need to step away sometimes from i i get sleepless and anxious and stressed with all the things that i feel like need doing in the world and 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 so on um but to step back into not running away from that but really like i think satish has managed quite beautifully in the last um, 10 15 years i think when i first got to know him he still had quite a charge and a chispa as, as well but to really just as he reminded me last week to transform by the presence you're bringing to the conversation and not to the outcome like it's not about the outcome um it's it's if you can enroll more and more people into that understanding of we 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 need this creative friction of us being in disagreement with each other where this should go for this to continue going and that's okay like to agree to disagree and and embrace at a higher level that your group is a fractal of that larger group you're working with um and therefore they're not other they're not the stupid ones that don't get it but they're just holding another part of the system um and it's it's difficult and every now and then we need to resource ourselves by just 
not sitting with that friction and finding like I I right now need so desperately to just focus on my family, my neighbors and my land and let the world change itself for a while. Um, because I for too long believed that I had a role in small ways of helping to transform things. And that can burn you out when you take it too seriously. So the, so like the last thing I need is somebody making my head bigger. I, I'm life's cooking me down to making my head very, very small, <laughs> make me very, very humble. Anyway, I hope that helps. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that in. That's lovely. Right, the Johnny and who's sitting next to you? Yeah, it's actually Ma that wants to <laughs> talk. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for the wonderful questions and conversation so far. Um, so I was wondering, now that we've talked about sense of belonging and land and finishing Schumacher and what's next and trying yeah to find this potential in the place and in yourself and like what what do you want to do or offer or how do you want to have this conversation with with others and the the, the place as well um i guess i'm just yeah trying to weave it out um to find yeah what how can i find this um place in which to start this conversation, um, finding my place in it. And I was just wondering what, if you would tell anything to yourself back then before finding this place in Mallorca, um, in which you, you're belonging now and which you're engaging now, if there's yeah anything that you would tell yourself before finding this place in which you started this conversation. Hmm. That's a really interesting question. Because of course I am who I am because I've done what I've done. I've learned what I've learned. I made the mistakes I made. And um, by trying to advise my younger self to do differently, I would therefore also advise my younger self to not be who I am now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't think I would want to do that. But... Um, But yeah, we talked a lot about place and, and how to be as expression of place again. And the thing is, we, we live in a globalized world and you're coming from different places to study at Schumacher. Many people don't even know what their place is. They don't, they're not, they're not sure if somebody like if the, I don't know what in German is called Reisen nach Jerusalem, the little toys, um, what's it called? When you have the chairs and one chair is missing and the music stops and everybody has to sit down. Yeah? That game um, has different names in different cultures, but exists almost anywhere. Imagine the music stops and you have to be in a place and in a bioregion. Which one would it be? Where do you take your stance? Yeah, and I wish maybe that I would have taken my stance in a particular place earlier than I did. And at the same time, I know that I wouldn't be who I am if I hadn't taken all these detours. But um, the value of actually not doing what I did for a long period of my life, which is to every time I felt that something was frustrating in a place, I just moved place. I was lucky enough to have a partner who was also into traveling and experiencing different cultures. And so we just moved places together 28 times. And um, until we got to a point of moving to Mallorca to saying, if we can't make it there, we can't make it anywhere in the sense of whatever will frustrate me in this place is something that is in me and will come up in any other place that I'll go to. And I will not move again it was actually 12 years ago it was a commitment to to say when you come to that point where you say this system is impossible the power structure the feudalism of this island the blah 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 the fact that i'm working more than i can 
to serve this island and some people would ideally want me off the island because I'm not from here. All those things at some point came up and at some point made me question, should should we move again? But but I think that, that there is, when we're all this power of place, <laughs> the power of place that comes through us when we commit to a place. And also, like, even in this earlier stage of career for the younger ones among you, where you also in the tension of, well, now I've put all this time and effort and privilege into getting educated. How do I now make a living in the world? Like, that's again, like we've talked about this earlier in terms of solutioneering. If you try to make a living in a world that is fundamentally going to transform in the next 15, 20 years, you're setting yourself up for possibly being skilled in one particular thing that is very quickly no longer needed. But if you pay attention to who you are and your essence and what you want to bring in the world and you allow yourself to be many different things, not just one thing, but you make you reduce that complexity in our privileged world where we could do anything if we have a little bit of support from our parents and whatever. Yeah? Um, to create the enabling constraint by committing to a place, to a community, to a bioregion. Um, I think that can be really powerful. And it took me a long, long time to, to be ready to do that. Um, nearly, nearly 40 years, I turned 40 a year after I arrived in, in Mallorca. And, and now I'm 51 and I haven't left and I still feel like I'm on the beginning of like it, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper um, this this shift in being of not taking my story and what am I doing but actually saying okay I, I, I'm, go I'm going to put myself to, at service to my community simply by by what I do, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. What I be, more importantly than what I do. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for sticking to your being in that place as well. Um, I I just, just one last thing. I was talking to Jardy Pijam this week and he said <laughs> a hi from him, so yeah. Lovely, uh, he, he was such a, powerful influence on on our cohort of holistic science students. It was a shame that he, um, again, dysfunctional personal stories that, that somehow made him leave the Schumacher family with, without necessarily like feeling a bit traumatized by it. And yet the service that he gave us when, when he was teaching um, at, at Schumacher was actually really transformative to, to me. Like it, I really appreciate having met Jordi 20 years ago. So <laughs> love to get that message. Thank you. Just before we go on to Marina's question, we are officially out of time. So I'm just wondering, how is everyone for time? Has everyone got another sort of five, 10 minutes max? Or do we need to jump off? Thank you, Daniel. Um, got a thumbs up from Shannon, great. Um, so Marina, over to you. And then I thought, um, we'll just do a few reflections at the end of everyone's given that um, after Marina's question. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. I'll try to be quick. Um, thanks, Daniel, for your very sincere uh, re reply and answers to questions. It's really inspiring for us because uh, sometimes you don't know what to do and you need support uh, from somebody who already had this journey after graduation which is really important. And regarding my personal journey, I came uh, here uh, during a really hard period uh, in my life. And as you said, like it's personal journey. Uh, and I feel like I am from Russia and in Russia they had, and they practice uh, these you know, resilient approaches, not talking about them, they just do it. <laughs> and I feel like, one day I might become a kind of a bridge between those polarized entities uh, that now becoming more and more isolated uh, from each other. And 
uh, my question is how to avoid certain traps on the way when you um, develop this sense of connection and belonging to land, for example, and then it transforms into nationalism, for example, because we kind of tend to fall into different uh, extreme points like globalization, uh, localization, uh, then uh, westernization, for example, of approaches. So we want to be westernized and then destroy what we have in our uh, countries. Uh, so maybe you can give some advice on that. Yeah, it's massive, that question, because of course there's, there's an insidiousness of kind of colonialism of the mind um, that that even this sort of planetary awareness conversation um, sometimes can be at odds with a with a kind of um, like it's replacing really deep rooted rituals and songs and and stories of how people have always been in place. And th th that's the thing all over the world, we still have remnants of structures that are very much living a much more regional supply chain and relationship embedded in place, sometimes by necessity. Um, people don't, like it's so easy to assume that, <laughs> I think we all know in in this context that that the majority of the planet doesn't have access to global goods like we might. And um, this we got in one of the um, questions we, we got to this before, like the danger of a parochial bioregionalism, a, a coming back to place and and defining, our, are we, we're going to come back to our customs and maintain them. I live this here on Mallorca as well. Like some people in the, their own way um, also would love to turn the clock back, but that's impossible. So it's it's always this, like what you were saying, like the people practicing this, living close to the land, even just growing and conserving food in the fa at the family scale and at the community scale is all over Russia. Also because that's how people survived um, at points in, in history and not maybe less recent history. But how can we celebrate these structures, celebrate our songs, our stories, our rituals of connecting with place without making it an exclusive? Like, uh, he's not one of us. He's not one of this tribe. He's not... Like because that is then not understanding the 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 synthesis of bringing the enlightenment with what what Owen Barfield called original participation together into what is final participation, which is we have the capability of both being in and of this world, but also seeing the world through a lens of abstraction, but we honor that that lens of abstraction is just one of many lenses. And then then in that, like the, you said, maybe you feel bridge building between these polarizing stories that, that have suddenly come out, out of nowhere again, that, that certainly a lot of people in the West thought we, we won't have again. Like I have so many Russian friends that I find it heartbreaking to think, to see how quickly the system polarized in creating an other us against them story in the media and so on and and i think that it's that's our our because this is possibly going to get worse for a while is to in each place remind ourselves of our shared humanity and our shared indigeneity to life itself and not build in, in another other um, in order to strengthen our own story. Um, that's that's for me something that, that we'll all have to do in, in one way or another. Um, I have to do it here on Mallorca. Um, and, and I also have to recognize the, the trauma and the hurt and 
the structural violence that has underprivileged certain groups for far too long that that it's it comes with a kind of uh, fight them energy um but fighting hasn't like an eye for an eye keep, the, keeps the will turn the whole world blind is one of the wise sayings and i think that there's is, is really wisdom in that we need to recover the ground of um that all our stories don't matter as much as life continuing and that all we ever are is an expression of life. And so all these separations are stories. But it's, it's a, paradox, a, par a paradox. How do we value all these ancient customs and songs and in an attempt to keep them pure, not create and, okay, you're not part of this. Uh, because in every region on the planet, we're now much more diverse than we were um, 50 years ago. I don't know whether that was an answer to your question, but I know we're running out of time. It would be nice to hear some reflections. Well, it just uh, ends up in the stories. Uh, whenever like, I talk to uh, anyone, and it means that we need to focus on positive stories mm -hmm. of action. Exactly. Um, something that I'm working on. Thank you. What a nice positive note to end on. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Um, and thank you so much, Daniel. Um, as I said, I thought it'd be really nice for us just to maybe share some reflections of the conversation today or any key takeaways. Um, so what I'm going to do is just set up a whiteboard, use it how you'd like to, maybe a post-it note, draw, whoever feels comfortable, over to you all. Um, but just as we're doing that, I was going to run through some of the, the topics we've discussed as a, as a little reminder. Um, and then also we've got the wonderful Johnny who's going to play some music for us as we reflect. So thank you so much, Johnny, in advance. Really appreciate it and looking forward to it. So in summary, we have spoken about the power of small interventions, recognising burnout, the power of counsel within an uncertain world, nature healing humanity and humanity healing nature, local action in global transformation, remembering the Schumacher network, the Schumacher alumni dream, <laughs> from problem solving to potential orientated mindsets, daring to a chosen Schumacher, openness and honesty, bringing animate earth back into the mainstream, the magic of Schumacher and walking together as a community, multiple ways of seeing, transforming people and places by your presence, taking a stance in place and committing to it, paying attention to self and being, and lastly, reminding ourselves of our shared humanity. So, lots of lovely thoughts there. So I'm just gonna open up the, um, the whiteboard. And Johnny, if it's good for you, please, um, please play some beautiful tunes. Yeah, sure. I hope this isn't too distracting whilst you try and think of you. <laughs> um, this is a song that um, uh, by Leonard Cohen. I mm. um, was reminded of by a post by Ma the other day. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a tricky one, so I hope, I hope it's all right. <clears throat> <laughs> At the break of day, start again, I heard them say, don't dwell on what has passed away, or oh, what is yet to be, oh the wars, they will be fought again, the holy dove, it will be caught again. Born and soul and born again, the dove is never free. Ring, ring the bell, bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. 
We asked for signs, and the signs were sent. The birth betrayed, the marriage spent, the widowhood of every government. Signs for all to see. Can't run no more with this lawless crowd. While the killers in high places say their prayers out loud. But they've summoned up, they've summoned up a thundercloud. And they're gonna hear from me. Ring the bell, bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. <clears throat> you can add up the parts, but you won't have the sum. You can strike up the march, there is no drum. Every heart, every heart to love will come, but like a refugee. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. Ring. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donny. I always love it when you play. It just takes me to a different world instantly. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, I also absolutely adore watching boards like this just emerge. I, I just always sit back and just, just watch what's going on. I think it's absolutely beautiful to see something just come from nothing instantly. It's really wonderful. So thank you so much for participating. Um, Daniel, just as, the, uh, just as we're finishing off uh, adding our reflections there, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Any lasting thoughts or comments? Me? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah. No, actually, I mean, I, I just one thing that um, one of the posts it says, reminding ourselves of our shared humanity, um, which of course is always in the context of also reminding ourselves of our shared indigeneity to life. Um, and, and I guess one of the really we didn't talk about it that much, but for me, it's 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 a powerful thing. We're coming back to place and to life. And in doing so, we're, we're bringing our collective inheritance of an indigenous wisdom of our capacity to be a regenerative presence in place back into the modern world. And I'm always a bit concerned that by framing indigenous versus non-indigenous points of view, or this is an indigenous person and this is an other, not indigenous person. We're actually perpetuating in our mimetic framing um, the, the story of se separation. And, and while it's so critical to name all the traumas and the systemic violence and injustice that is still being inflicted upon people who are currently in the category of indigenous people. I think in this coming back to our shared humanity, we have to, the shared ground that we actually have is our shared indigeneity to life that goes beyond any of these categories and ultimately goes to the point of saying, let's forget about whether there's a good outcome or a bad outcome and simply be, simply live 
simply take the opportunity of relating as long as we we have it. It's not about whether um, humanity survives. It's about how can we change how humanity has influenced the rest of the community of life back to being gardeners, back to being regenerative, and then trust that that's the most we can do, irrespective of how late in that transformation we might already be. Mm. Yeah, thank, thank you, Daniel. It also reminds me of the point you mentioned earlier around we constantly talk about nature as a separate thing when actually the answer is in recognizing that we are nature and we are part of nature and really, really appreciating that unity between, between us. So um, thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna close the whiteboard. So just briefly, like we had this conversation about maybe sharing this with you that anybody, I mean, maybe you can hold that process to check whether everybody is all right with it. Right now you have the recording. I'm, I'm happy to share it on one of, my channels if people feel it's okay for them i'm also absolutely happy with it not being shared if just one person says no nah, i'm actually not that happy with having this comment i mean if anybody like i've been quite uh, yeah vulnerable in in my own way um but i'm i'm fine with sharing it personally but it's 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 your decision so Perfect. thank you daniel i really really appreciate the offer and um I think we all got thumbs up there. Is everyone cool? Yeah. Just yeah. Make, we don't have the the quiet the, the disagreeing voice. You don't have to like if you if you, if it, only one person doesn't want it, then just get in touch with Chantali and Sarah, yeah. and 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 we don't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, th I think it's time for us all to um, say a massive thank you to you, Daniel. Can we all just come off mute for a second and say thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, you so much. So much. Thank, you Thank, you Thank, much. You Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chantali and Sarah for organizing. Yeah, yes, the yes. best yes. Yes. Lots of love and keep up the spirit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. We really appreciate it. And uh, as you said, talking from your from your heart has been really clear throughout the whole conversation. <laughs> such openness and honesty. So I really do appreciate it and the offer to come back and, and see us again. So uh, the offer's always there as well from our perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, have a lovely day. Bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Thank you girls, you're up.